Well, my name is Roberto. For those who don't, don't know me, and for those who do know me, I'm still Roberto. So I'm going to be. This is the last talk. I know you're tired. I know you want to go bar hopping. I'm going to be doing my best to keep you awake. So I work for Critical, which is a cryptographic, uh, a custom cryptographic creation company. We also do software development, and we love Django, myself and the company. We've been uh, backers of, of many uh, high-profile uh, <clears throat> Django projects, like uh, the schema migration project, like uh, High Performance Django by, by Peter Baumgartner, and we are gold sponsors of the Django REST framework uh, Kickstarter. <clears throat> I've been doing software development for 20, uh, 29 years. Uh, my first claim of fame uh, came by uh, helping uh, reverse engineer the Nintendo. So if you ever got fired by uh, playing uh, a sloppy made uh, pixelated games in your cell phone, that's on you, not on me. <clears throat> uh, in the Django world, I'm known for a few projects. and. Uh, uh, one of the most uh, recent ones uh, who have been uh, had a lot of uh, visibility is Mayan EDMS. It's a document management system done entirely on Django. So how I got into into this mess? Uh, in 2013, I was appointed director of software development for the government of Puerto Rico, and I had to oversee the creation and use of software in the government. And one of the uh, the projects I was handed was that the, the government of Puerto Rico had just signed an executive order. Uh, ordering all government agencies to start sharing data electronically. But we had no, no infrastructure to do that. And this is the problem. This is the, the scenario I was given. We, have, uh, we had, at that time, 142 government agencies, each of them creating and accumulating data in completely incompatible formats and with no way to share the data. Some of the most uh, forward-looking agencies did try uh, to, f to fix the problem on themselves. But because there was no policy, no oversight, the end solution was the same. Everybody just kept wasting money doing in, uh, uh, completely inter non-interoperable interfaces and export of the data. <coughs> so pretty much this was my reaction. To what is going on here with? So I realized we did not understand the problem. So the first thing we did was just make a checklist. What do we need? to make this happen. OK, we need an export, and an universally uh, compatible export tool where we can take any data, government data, and export it into a new format like JSON and XML, and regardless of what the original file format was. And then we realized that does not exist in the universe. So basically, we just had to create it ourselves. We just uh, were a, a, a new experimental uh, software development department for the government, so let's honor our name. Let's start development, developing. And this is what we came on. We, we came up with uh, Libre. It's a, uh, actually a, a, a backronym uh, to uh, create a, an engine to free up government data. Libre in, in English means free. So it was also kind of a, 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 political, a political statement. Uh, this is the eagle eye view, basically what, what the platform actually managed to do. We can take completely heterogeneous uh, data source, regardless of format, and uh, the place where the data is being originated. And just by doing a simple de description of how the data is uh, 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 structured, we can import government data. Uh, we can do versioning on the government data. And we can start hosting also open government data from the same product because infrastructure is also another big problem in the government. You can have, uh, you have very few government agencies that have good infrastructure. Most of them uh, will collapse as soon as they get 100 concurrent users. Uh, we also had to create a, a unified query language because our users are now more technical. The, the, the public is more technical. So some people do want to see just an infographic, but most of our users now just want access to the data themselves to do statistic analysis, analysis mathematical analysis. So we had to come up with, a, with an unified way so that our, our new clientele, uh, the developer clientele, could, could filter, could select what they wanted. And we had to support as many output formats as, it, as we could, not just the original file format. We have to support JSON for, for JavaScript development. You have, we have to support XML. So Django REST framework was very crucial in this part. So now we can have completely outdated government data, and it can be used in a lot of different scenarios. 
So this is now where, uh, uh, how Libre fits in the whole ecosystem. We can have now all government agencies producing data, how they know how to produce it, and we can now drop in this tool, and they don't have to change anything internally, how to do things, how they, how they skip producing this data, and yet the data can now be shared, can be used by other government agencies, other general public. And we can start, turn stuff, very ugly stuff like this. I hate spreadsheet files. They have no kind of validation. They, they don't tell you anything. And we can start turning them into beautiful stuff like this that a software developer can use without having to worry about importing the file. We can turn completely ugly stuff like this. This is a shape file. Uh, it is a very bad number, uh, name for a, 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 a file format because it's not a single file. It's a distribution of files. You can blame SS, uh, ESRI for that. And we can turn them into this. We, the, the tool also had to support geospatial capabilities, which is another big topic in the government. The government has a lot of geospatial uh, data that is being uh, produced, but it's being produced sometime in outdated formats. In Puerto Rico, we, we had most of our, our maps, our state plane projection in NAT27 format. It's a, a format that was uh, standardized in 1927, and we started to move to NAT83. Uh, uh, still was not interoperable because it's a, it's a, it was a, a state-centric format. And with this tool, we can now convert all those data pre, uh, completely transparently into WGS84, uh, which is a, a geocentric, it's a world-centric projection. So now Puerto Rican data can be plotted in, in stuff that is designed to work around the world. So basically, we are, we are modernizing uh, government data. Uh, for developers, for example, now they can take a legacy check file from the government and using the Libre platform, they, they can, uh, we can render a map and a developer can just capture the map uh, in, in an iframe and you can actually now um, incorporate geospatial capabilities in your software without having to write code just by capturing a render map from a query you just issued to the platform. And you can just start doing stuff like this from data that was originally came from outdated shape files that were just uh, accumulating bit rot in, in a government server and, and from uh, Excel spreadsheets. So we, this is the, the kind of reaction we started getting from the developers. But the administrators started hating it because they already have this amount of work. DevOps are very stressful people. They, they, they have the weight of the infrastructure on their shoulders. And having them create descriptor files for the files that they were going to import into the platform was, very, was, was becoming another um, obstacle into the platform. So that's where uh, the Django administration uh, a tool came into the rescue. And on top of that, Django suit allowed us to, to create this new in, uh, web interface where a person without no knowledge of how to create a YAML file can describe the file format that they are going to export. So now DevOps, which are sometimes the only technical person in a government agency staff, now he can, without having to know, uh, be a data scientist as a, a software developer, now he can use this tool to start uh, exporting its government agency data. And uh, we started getting this reaction, and this is, oh, software development is so easy, I want to become a, be a developer myself. So th that, that's how successful the, the, the conversion to Django admin was. So, they the came from, we started, the, the platform got very popular in Puerto Rico. So we had a company whose name started with, with M, means very small and soft at the end. And they said, no, we already fixed this problem that you, you are reinventing the wheel. We have tools that create web services from all our databases. Now, which ones of you work with web services? Which one of you like working with web services? Nobody, see? <laughs> so the problem with web services is if you don't have a, a, a sufficient documentation, have you, any one of you have tried to reverse engineer a complex type from a web service without documentation? It's not possible. So you're very dependent on documentation, and web services have become a way to promote vendor locked in. Uh, another problem is standardization. That's why we jump from WSDL 1.1 to 2.0. To and there's a 1.2 and 1.3 draft that never made it into, the, into the, the public because they were completely interoperable. And the tools that are creating WSDL files, the, the Web Service Description uh, Language files, sometimes create 
uh, description files which are not even interoperable between one vendor and the other. So it's, it's like trying to, to assemble an IKEA uh, table with an instructions, and bad things tend to happen. <laughs> And so web services were just outside the door. So the tool had to be a REST-centric uh, tool. No, even if, if, they, if, if people didn't like it, we had to do because there's a, a beautiful thing about REST. REST and JSON are self-documenting. Even if you don't have documentation, you see this and you know it's a dictionary, it's a key value pair. And even as cryptic as the key value is, you still have a rough idea what this is and how to operate it. And because we are using Django REST framework from the same solution, now we can re-export using, using Django REST framework renders to a different formats. And I love this. This is why our company is a gold sponsor of Django REST framework. The browsable API allows developers to start playing with the data, to start exploring the data, and get used to the data even if there's no documentation for it. So what about a, a unified query language to be able to access all this completely different data sets. This is the same reaction we got from the company whose name starts with M. They said, no, we already solved that. There's something called SQL that's used for accessing data where you want to create the, the recreate the wheel. Because stuff like this. This is the name. This is a, a web, uh, the source code from an actual website, a uh, government website. I'm not going to say the name. Shout out government. There are actually concatenating and creating an SQL statement in JavaScript, trusting user input, and not doing any kind of sanitation or checks. So I talked to the developer that did this from that company, and, and I, I, I was going to ask him if he knew about SQL injections and sanitation, but I said, no, I'm going to ask him even a more interesting question. Do you know who Bobby Table is? And he said no, so that was my answer. So SQL was, was out of the question, too, because SQL is not a standard. It's a structured query language. Whoever told you that SQL stands for standard query language was playing a really cruel joke on you. It is not. This is an actual question on Stack Overflow I, cre I did while creating the, the platform because I wanted to know how to limit the amounts of results in, in, a, in a result set for the query. And it turns out it's not even that simple thing. It's not even standardized across databases. So we ended up creating our own language. It's called LeetQuil, the LeetQuil query language. Now, another problem with data exporting tools is that you need a software, a server, and a client. So still you get that element of vendor lock-in. So what we did is we created a RESTful query language. Basically, the URL is the query that will give you filtering, a selection, and slicing for the data. Here we have an example. This is a shape file, a polygon from the municipalities of Puerto Rico. And if you, the URL is kind of small, but if you see it, I'm asking, I'm having two, uh, two predicates. I'm telling it, give me only the shape, the polygons whose properties in the name uh, municipio, which is municipality, contains the fragment Gua ignoring case. So I get Gua inabo, Aguas buenas, Caguas. And instead of getting just uh, data, I'm telling it, give me that, render it into a leaflet now. This, this is a very nice feature of Django REST framework. The renders can also give you maps or charts or, or, or tables. It, they don't necessarily have to be numbers or, or uh, serialized data. This is another example of a simple query. This is uh, the crime points of the Department uh, of Police, and we are filtering just for the crimes of type 4, aggravated aggression. This is the kind of thing now we can filter, we can start analyzing just by rewriting a simple URL. Because we were using uh, Django and Leaflet, we started incorporating Django's uh, templating system into Leaflet uh, pop-up and markup language. And now from Django, we can start customizing, creating a customi uh, customized map, and we created a map builder. And we can start doing stuff like this. I can take a shape file, from one government agency and start doing stuff like this. This is the whole universe, universe of, of crimes in Puerto Rico being filtered by the result querying 
from a polygon of a municipality from the Puerto Rico Planning Board. So basically, basically, this is a join between two data sets completely different com in two completely different uh, government agencies. And this is a, a municipality-centric query. And this is a URL that produces that. There's no code, it's just one URL. It looks complicated, but you will see in a moment it's actually just four elements. And even with the first two, you can produce them up. The last two are just a uh, um, cosmetic uh, markup. The first thing is I'm telling the engine what is the, the data I want to work with. This is, a, this is the crime data. And I'm telling it, filter all those crimes where the geometry of the crime, in this case a point, falls within the geometry, and the minus bracket is a subquery marker, where the, the encompassing geometry is the result set from a simple query to the planning board asking just for the polygon of the municipality called Arecibo. And the JSON path is actually slicing the properties of the, of the, of the uh, geospatial feature and just giving me the data points, the, 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 uh, the, the, the uh, map points, and then passing that then to the geometry and doing a filtering. So this, this, this is basically a typecasting during runtime from the URL. This is then, uh, this is telling the engine to, to render a map, not giving me the data points, and to be able to, to see the outline, because the, the, the map wouldn't produce anything, and passing also context to the renderer. Please paint me the outline so I know what I'm filtering by. Because uh, knowledge of the, of the language, there was a, a little bit of barrier, so we created also a query builder for the tool. And this is where you can start experimenting, filtering data. You have a preview on the bottom, and you can, ask, uh, you can do stuff like producing the result set as a dictionary list, so it is, it, it is already processed to be able to be plotted into a chart. You don't have to do any post-processing, for example, in JavaScript, and you can take that as it is outputted into stuff like D3.js and already start plotting charts, excuse me. And after you have the data you, you, you want, all you have to do is copy paste the query string. And we can start using, doing stuff like this. This is an egocentric, a self-centric result set of the same crime map or the same crime data. I'm asking the engine, show me all the crimes in a radius from where I'm standing from. And the query is even simpler. I have the same police crime data, but I'm filtering, instead of filtering for the result set of a polygon, I'm filtering just for a point, and because points don't have area, I'm doing a buffer, which in this case, in this projection and zoom level, is just 0.1 arcs, which correlates to roughly 10 miles. So I'm basically telling the, the engine, give me all the crime that have happened where a 10 mile radius from where I'm standing to see if I'm in a danger of being mugged or assaulted or killed. And it's a good place, for example, to do a, 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 a party because the only thing that has happened is just aggravated aggression, just a fist fight. So if I'm going to park my car, I know that it's a good place because car theft has not happened there in the time frame that this data set uh, was created. And we can do also this. This is called uh, um, feature analysis. I can see how the crime behaves in regards to a, a, a geographical feature. In this case, this is the PR22, Puerto Rico's biggest highway. And it has been criticized that there's not enough um, police, uh, I don't know how to say this in English, but uh, the routing, the, the, the preventive uh, uh, patrolling. So we did this simple analysis, and we can automatically know that at the south, to the south of the highway, there's basically no crime happening at the, uh, in the time set, which is two years that, this, what, that, that was collected. So there is something happening at the north of the highway that's causing a bigger uh, crime rate. I cannot tell you what it is, but now I can give you the observation to do the right questions. And this is the start of the scientific method. So I give you the observation, now you explain why this is happening. Before this, we had no idea this was even happening. The query to do this is basically the same, but instead of a circle or a polygon, we are creating a polygon runtime just four data points a square. So this is more in-depth now how the tool works. This is now more uh, nitty-gritty details. Because I cannot filter or give users the data every time they requested it. It is a very heavy operation. We took a page from DNS. This is a, a write once, 
a worm. Write once, read many times. So all the processing was moved into the import phase. And this is the import phase. The first thing we did is do a scheduler because I cannot trust the government agencies to give me the data. I basically have to go and get it forcefully. <laughs> That's how great they are. And <laughs> the next step is to do an origins layer. So tell the engine how to get to the data. Once the engine has the data, there's a data, a data driver's uh, layer, which, is, which tells it how to understand, how to process the data. Is it an Excel file, a REST API? It came from a shape file. Then we serialize uh, the data to store it, to be able to store it in a database, because it's binary data. And, and for this specific implementation, we chose uh, Base64 encoded pickle files so that they can be uh, stored in the database. Base64 pickle file. This, this is your cue to, to squirm to get nauseated. So. <laughs> so it's not glamorous, but for this particular implementation, we wanted just to get the data out. So no MongoDB, no fancy infrastructure, just code one order of magnitude of your worst case scenario. See, you never thought you were going to get a business lesson from a Django Gondiva uh, presenter. And this is now the, the read part. This is where we process the request for the data. Uh, just cookie cutter stuff, Django REST framework does most of it. We make sure that the user that is accessing the data has access to the data. Is it maybe we want to control this specific data set just for government employees, or maybe it's a public, completely public data. And then we pass it to our own custom engine where the, the query is split into its parts. Uh, filtering, grouping, aggregation, and segmentation. The data is then deserialized from the database and rendered in whatever format the user is asking it. And then we just pipe that to the uh, response, uh, to this response object that Django REST framework uh, supports. Now that, and that's, this is a bookmark of the presentation, that's where the project died. After 12 years, I became tired of the hate because it, if you're a software development in a place where nobody's technical, you get a lot of hate. If you work in the government, you get even more hate. You get hate explicitly, implicitly, and secretly. Your boss hates you secretly because you are showing that he's not prepared for the job you are. Your coworkers are in, hate you implicitly because you are this software developer, you are this wizard of technology, and yet you refuse to, to fix the coffee machine. And the public in general, you are just a government employer, employee, they're gonna hate you anyway. So after, after 12 years of being a lightning rod of hate, I decided to move forward, and now the company where I work for are very open for community projects, and we are actually hosting our own copy of Libre and hosting public government agency in our, in, in our infrastructure, so basically we are doing the government's job. And with this, this data hosted, now we can start uh, the, uh, doing uh, really cool stuff like this, like, for, for example, creating dashboards uh, using completely, uh, completely uh, disparate data for example, this is the, the section of the data sets of the Department of Energy uh, Agency. Has really not much interesting data, like how much clients they have, how much energy they've sold. You can see it in a table. But when you plot it into stuff like this, you start seeing patterns. You start seeing correlation. You start seeing behaviors that should not be happening. Like for example, in this chart, uh, you see that the amount of industrial clients, the, the power company, uh, for, uh, and I have to excuse me because this is from right to left. At this time, we, had, we hadn't even implemented ordering in the engine. That's fixed now. So the power company has lost two-thirds two -thirds order of, of their industrial clients, and yet their revenue for the concept of industrial in, uh, uh, income never decreased. That's not supposed to happen. So we started showing stuff like this. This is, for example, the dashboard of the health department. Uh, Puerto Rico is a, is a tropical island. We have a lot of, of mosquito-borne based disease. Uh, sadly, some people do die. But this, uh, diseases are preventable. It's just about um, making sure that, that, that people get the help they need at the right time. So there's a lot of money allocated into awareness. Uh, if you see now, if you when we plotted this and we added the, the data of asthma, the problem of asthma in the island completely overshadows the problem of mosquito-borne diseases. And when you look at the amount of budget that's being allocated for asthma research and asthma awareness, it's just a fraction of what mosquito-borne diseases awareness programs are getting. 
And when you plot stuff like diabetes, it completely crushes the problem of, of, of asthma, even though both are chronic uh, um, diseases, asthma, uh, diabetes is a, real pro a really big problem in the island. And when you put hypertension to something very interesting happened, the behavior of hypertension in the island almost directly correlate the behavior of diabetes in the island. So a statistical will bark at this and say correlation doesn't imply causation, but you cannot deny that there is something happening there. Uh, the government of Puerto Rico also wanted that we have a very big problem in the, uh, uh, the town halls. The, the people are leaving the town centers because of technology. Now they have Netflix and stuff like this. And the, government, the, the, the central government wanted to uh, start giving free Wi-Fi in public spaces. And they were starting already to allocate a few million dollars till we got this map up. This is the map of all the municipalities which were, by their own initiative, giving free Wi-Fi in the town centers. So they were fixing the problem in the first place and fixing the problems and getting people all already into the public spaces. So just this map saved a few million dollars in budget. And this is the same crime map, like I said, created just using just an iframe with just three filters municipality, time, and type of crime. And when you start running this, you start seeing time-based crime maps, and you see how crime is more organic than you think. Crime behaves very differently from the time of year, and even, excuse me, from the time of day. We started seeing how most crimes have a peak at 2 a.m., and yet uh, how theft hits its peak was, was uh, 9 p.m., 9 a.m., and 12 p.m., 12 p.m. Usually the times, the working class were outside the homes. So even doing stuff as simple as sending employees at different time brackets to have lunch at their houses would have reduced the problem of house theft. This, is, this was one, uh, a very interesting data. This is the Department of Solid Waste data. And they gave it to me. They were very nice. This was one of the few government agencies that really cooperated with the effort. And he said, but this is really worse, worthless data. That I'm going to give it to you. I said, just put it out there. People are going to find a way to use this. And they did. This is a project from a hackathon. They actually won best uh, mobile app, uh, web app. It was created by three uh, university students in less than 24 hours. And it's called GeoTires. And it's the scenario for, for the application is you are just doing internal tourism in the island, and suddenly you, can't, uh, you got a flat tire in a place you have no idea, you don't know anything about that place. So the application will give you a map using our technology and give you all the places where you can go fix your car before you become stranded with the metadata so you can call negotiate places, and if you click, we'll give you the route to get there as soon as possible. All of this from a data from a government agency that's actually disappeared because that's how unimportant the government think that is from a data that even the government agency that was producing it thought was worthless. Now we can have a commercial, uh, a product that can resolve a real social problem. And this is a snippet of the code and you can see we are serving, you can see the name of the company in the middle and you can see that actually they are feeding the application from the, the instance, the public instance we are, we are uh, hosting. They get the latitude and the longitude via JavaScript from the user. They just filter it. Thank you. So these efforts got noticed by one great, awesome government agency, the Institute of Statistics. And they, they, they contracted us to start. They have a, a massive amount of information, a massive amount of data, and very few tools to get to them. So we got in contact with them. And the stuff that has been happening with that data is amazing. I'm going to try not to get you all killed. I did sacrifice my last copy of Microsoft Office to the gods, so let's see. <laughs> These are the maps I just showed you. Last, uh, this is using all open source software, the open source Libre engine, and the Cards BI, and opens on uh, a dashboard applications, application I created from Django 0.6 beta. And you can see the behavior of the electric company. 
you can see the behavior of the Puerto Rico grid for the last 10 years, and you can see the peaks and the valleys of how usage behaves in Puerto Rico, and you can start predicting uh, which month of the year the grid is most likely to collapse. And the power company didn't know this. They were sending their brigades in June and July, and when they saw the data, we realized September or October are usually the most. So they were paying over time in two months that nothing was happening and didn't have enough brigades at the times, at the months of the year that the electricity was collapsing. And we also saw a very interesting curve. Uh, the electric company likes to make everybody uncomfortable and blame the problems of the electric grid in the people, that you are wasting too much electricity, please turn out your lights. But these charts demonstrate that now, 1.3 million kilowatts in 10, 10 years ago, Puerto Rico has actually consumed less electricity now than 10 years ago. So why is the grid continue to collapse? It's not because of use, it's because of a lack of maintenance. So now I can start shifting blame, I can actually point fingers now. So this is just the open source version, and now this is the commercial version that we recreated from scratch. It doesn't use Base64 anymore, it now uses a more sane solution. And the kind of projects we are doing with it are much more interesting like for example this one. Exodus in Puerto Rico is a very serious problem. People are leaving the island and not coming back. At what rate? At an alarming rate. This is all Bureau of Transportation data combined with, the, with census data. And this is the comparison chart of how many people are leaving the island, the destinations, the airports they're using to leave the island, and the final aggregation. 5.2 million, 5.9 if you round it up, 5.2 million people left the island in 2013 and only 5.2 came back. So I have a difference of minus 1,000 residents in an island of only 4 million people. You can see the problem now. And <clears throat> with stuff like this, I can start predicting the peaks, the, the touristic peaks. So at what times of years the government need to prepare to receive and to make enough accommodations for tourists to see if it can fix this problem. And we can start doing things like this. I'm gonna have to, yeah. There's a big problem in Puerto Rico and it is a political issue that says that the argument is that there is more toxic emissions in places where there is a lower economic uh, income in the area. And this is a great project to start experimenting with that. It is a map that will, I'm getting some latency there. It is a map that correlates the amount of toxic emissions, which companies are emitting them, if they're emitting the correct toxics they are registered for, and the income level of the area compared, compared to the mean gross uh, uh, product, uh, uh, gross uh, GP, GPD of the, of the island. And you can start doing experiments like this to see how this theory is correct in the island. And you can see that some companies are starting, are starting to throw into the atmosphere these nasty chemicals just a few miles behind your backyard. Nobody knew this until we did this. So that pretty much is my wrap up. If you have questions, uh, comments, please be kind. <laughs>